The charming city of Nuremberg is over 950 years old and is located in the very heart of Germany. For centuries, Nuremberg was the unofficial capital of the Holy Roman Empire. Successive German kings or emperors resided and held court here. It was a place of power and prestige. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis saw Nuremberg as the perfect stage for their activities. Huge fanatical Nazi rallies were held here. From this platform, Hitler delivered his fiery speeches that stirred the emotions of his people. Nuremberg became a center of Nazi ideals. Here plans were made and strategies finalized. Adolf Hitler planned to unite Europe and establish an empire that would last for a thousand years, the Thousand Year Reich. He plunged the world into the largest, most destructive, most violent, and most widespread war the world has ever seen. But Adolf Hitler could have saved himself, his people, and the world a lot of heartache and agony if only he'd taken note of an ancient prophecy cast in stone above the entrance to the old town hall or Rathaus right here in Nuremberg. This amazing prophecy, written 2,600 years ago, accurately predicted the future of Europe, the outcome of World War II, and the fate of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And it also contains a message for us today. Don't miss it. Nuremberg is a city of castles, cathedrals, and canals. Here, German emperors were crowned, saints were buried, and the most famous and talented German artists in history created awe-inspiring works. Today, Nuremberg is the second largest city in the state of Bavaria after Munich, which is about 170 kilometers south. Nuremberg held great significance during the Nazi era. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis saw Nuremberg as the perfect stage for their activities. Because of the city's relevance to the Holy Roman Empire and its position in the center of Germany, the Nazi party chose the city to be the site of huge Nazi party conventions. In 1933, Adolf Hitler declared that Nuremberg should be the city of the Nazi party rallies. The Nazis constructed monumental buildings, arenas and roads for these mass rallies, events and parades. These fanatical party rallies became huge Nazi propaganda events. From this very platform, Adolf Hitler delivered his passionate and fiery speeches that raised the hopes and stirred the emotions of his people. Nuremberg became a center of Nazi ideals. Here plans were made and strategies finalized. Adolf Hitler planned to unite Europe and establish an empire that would last for a thousand years, the Thousand Year Reich. He plunged the world into the largest, most destructive, most violent and most widespread war the world has ever seen. It was the first truly global war. Every continent participated. World War II involved 61 countries with nearly two billion people, three quarters of the world's population. 62 million people lost their lives. Hitler arrogantly believed he could conquer Europe with the strength of his armies and establish a world empire that would last for a thousand years. But there was one German soldier, 
Franz Hasel in the Elite Pioneer Company 699, who boldly told his superiors that Hitler was doomed to failure. Franz Hasel was absolutely certain about this. And you know the reason he was so sure? This prophecy cast in stone above the entrance to the old town hall here in Nuremberg. These stone images depict a prophecy from the Bible book of Daniel written 2,600 years ago. It predicted the outcome of World War II and the fate of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. At the risk of death, Hazel told his commanding officer, Captain Mikus, that Germany would never unite Europe under the Nazi swastika and control the world. He boldly stated that Hitler and his plans were doomed. As Unit 699 drove deep into Russia, Captain Mikus believed what Hazel was saying and carried extra fuel and supplies, hoping for a safe retreat. They were among the very few who returned home safely from the Russian front. So what is this prophecy from the Bible book of Daniel? Well, let's take a closer look at these prophetic images cast in stone above the entrance to the old town hall. The first image is of a lion with eagle's wings, together with a statue of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The second is a bear along with an image of Cyrus the Great of Medo-Persia. A closer look at the other image shows a leopard with four heads and is matched with a statue of Alexander the Great of Greece. The fourth is a nondescript beast with ten horns and is matched with Julius Caesar of Rome. So what do Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome have to do with Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich, symbolised by these Nazi megastructures behind me? Well, let's find out. Our investigation starts in Babylon. Babylon was once the golden city of the ancient world. A great warrior king, Nebuchadnezzar, ruled it from 605 to 562 BC. His rule stretched through most of the Middle East. And at the time, this was the center of the world. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and his armies struck out westward on a mission of conquest. As part of their mission, they attacked the city of Jerusalem. They besieged and plundered the city, looting the temple and carrying off many of the sacred golden vessels. Daniel, a young Jewish prince, was taken captive and with the cream of the city's youth, carried off to Babylon as a war hostage, where he was trained to be a servant of the king and one of the empire's wise men. Now, we pick up this story in the Bible book of Daniel in the second chapter. Soon after Daniel's appointment to the royal staff, strife broke out in the palace. Nebuchadnezzar had gone to bed worried about Babylon and the future of his kingdom. As he slept that night, the king had a dream that seemed to contain omens. And because of the great importance he placed on dreams, he had to know what the dream meant. But then a peculiar thing happened. Nebuchadnezzar forgot his dream. In his desperation to recall it, he brought in his magicians, astrologers, sorcerers and wise men that claimed to be able to read minds and foretell the future. To this assembly of the wise men of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar brings his strange demand. I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. These astrologers and magicians claim to have psychic powers in contact with the gods. They claim to be able to read the stars and foretell the future. Now, it was up to them to either prove their claims or expose their deceit. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. They figured they could analyze the dream 
and then just make up any old interpretation they wanted. He recognized what they were trying to do. So notice what he demanded. Tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. Well, the so-called wise men failed miserably. Notice what they nervously confessed. There isn't a man alive who can tell others what they have dreamed. This is an impossible thing the king requires. No one except the gods can tell you your dream and they are not here to help. The wise men couldn't meet the king's demands and so were exposed as frauds. In a moment of anger, Nebuchadnezzar commanded that they all be killed. Execute them, he commanded. Execute all the wise men of Babylon. Now, although Daniel knew nothing of this incident, the soldiers came for him as well because he was considered a wise man. Desperate, he prayed for divine intervention because, well, without it, he was going to be killed. According to the text, God revealed the king's dream and its interpretation to Daniel. He then got to speak with the king. Notice what he said in Daniel chapter 2, 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has told you in your dream what will happen in the future. He then told the king, there is only one dependable source of information about the future, Daniel's God. The king leaned forward as if impatient to hear the dream and its interpretation. Then Daniel went on to outline the entire dream. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Well, very simple. The king's dream was of a large statue. Its head was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet a mixture of iron and clay. Notice as Daniel continues in Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and gold were broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now here comes the action. The statue is standing there when a stone comes down and smashes it to smithereens. And then a wind comes and blows away the remains. And that stone becomes a mountain that covers the whole earth. Now, what could this strange dream have to do with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, you say? And what message does it contain for us today? Well, as we will discover, the dream outlines the future in an amazing way. In only 150 words, the dream sketched the main course of history from Babylon's day, 600 BC, to the climax of Earth's history, including the period of the Second World War. It starts in Nebuchadnezzar's day and stretches generation after generation right down until the time of modern Europe and beyond. But what does it all mean? Well, breathlessly, the king waited for the interpretation. And here it is in Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. This is the dream. And now we will interpret it to the king. You are that head of gold. How clear, how plain. We'll find out as the prophecy unfolds that each part of this metal image represents a world empire or nation that follows one after another. For notice what Daniel went on to say in Daniel chapter 2, verses 39 and 40. After you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours, 
Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all others. Pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? After Babylon came a second kingdom, though inferior to Babylon. After that, a third kingdom. And finally, a fourth one made of crushing iron. So the bottom line is that this was indeed a dream about the rise and fall of great world empires, starting with Babylon. Now, just as this prophecy predicted, three other great world empires arose. History shows that after Babylon fell, the Medo-Persian Empire came. That was the second empire. After Medo-Persia came the vast Greek Empire, which expanded under Alexander the Great. The Jewish historian Josephus documented how Alexander the Great knew his destiny as a result of being shown the prophecies of Daniel. And then the predicted fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, followed after the fall of Greece. All this just as Daniel had predicted. So there we have them. Four great world empires following one after another. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. Now, do they ring a bell? Well, of course. They are the very same four empires cast in stone above the entrance to the old town hall in Nuremberg. Now, here is where this gets very interesting. The Iron of the Legs symbolized ancient Rome. But the Iron of Rome continues down into the feet where the iron was mixed with clay. Remember, its legs were of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, all the other metals remained where they were. The gold in the head, the silver in the arms and chest, the bronze in the belly. But the iron, the symbol of Rome, began in the legs and continued all the way to the feet where it was mixed with clay. Clay. We think of clay as brittle, especially in contrast to iron. What does this mean? Well, Daniel explains in Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 to 43. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of the iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. Now look at what you have here. When pagan Rome fell, it was not going to be replaced by a single empire like the ones that preceded it. Remember, each empire was replaced by a different metal symbolizing the new one. In contrast, Rome had been divided up, carved up in what had become and are still now the nations of modern Europe. And that's why the iron remains all the way down, even into the feet and toes where it was mixed with clay. This prediction was made about 600 years before Christ. And look how accurately it depicts the situation in Europe to this day. The Roman Empire was divided into different powers that ultimately became modern Europe. But notice what else it said about them in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with clay. You'll notice it says, they will not adhere one to another. That is, these nations will never be united. Two world wars in the last century alone were nothing but these nations massacring each other. And even today, in many places, things are still very touchy. 
Sure, there's the European Union and a single currency, at least in part of Europe. But even all this is in danger of fraying. You only have to look at what's happening in Greece and Britain to see how unstable, uncertain and divided Europe really is. The Bible predicted that the nations of Europe would mix together and try to unite. However, the Bible also predicted that no matter how hard they try, they would never become fully united. They will not adhere to one another. The most powerful military men in history have tried. Charlemagne tried and failed. Charles V tried and failed. Louis XIV tried and failed. And Napoleon Bonaparte tried and failed. And then came Kaiser Wilhelm II. He set out to unite Europe in 1914. But we all know the tragic end of the Kaiser story. He plunged the nations into World War I with terrible consequences. Over 16 million soldiers and civilians lost their lives. And then came Adolf Hitler. With an army of five million, Hitler promised to do what the Kaiser couldn't. Here he was building the largest indoor arena the world had ever seen. He promised his people to unite Europe and build an empire that would last for a thousand years. A thousand year Reich. Well, we've already seen the results of his attempt to unite Europe. His mega complex is nothing but a pile of ruins and he perished amidst the ruins of his own bunker. Hitler could have saved himself, his people and the world a lot of pain and heartache if only he'd taken notice of that prophecy cast in stone over the entrance to the Old Town Hall in Nuremberg. You see, it's another of Daniel's prophecies. It's found in Daniel chapter 7 and builds on the foundation provided by Daniel chapter 2. It follows the same historical outline as Daniel 2. It's a parallel prophecy. It also predicted the same four great world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. But instead of using metals to represent these empires, it uses animals. So the lion with wings is matched with a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, symbolizing Babylon and the gold head of the Daniel II statue. The bear is matched with Cyrus the Great, symbolizing Medo-Persia and the silver chest and arms of the great statue. The leopard is matched with Alexander the Great, symbolizing Greece and the thighs of bronze in the statue. And finally, the beast with 10 horns is matched with Julius Caesar, symbolizing Rome and the legs of iron of the statue. Like Daniel 2 and the great metal image, Daniel 7 and its animal symbols predicted that there would only be four great world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. That's it. There wouldn't be a fifth one. Now, why is this ancient king's dream relevant to us today? Simply because it shows us where we are living in the stream of time. Where are we living? Not in the time of the head of gold, not in the time of the chest and arms of silver, not in the time of the thighs of bronze, and not in the time of the legs of iron, but in the feet and toes of iron and clay. Where are we living today? In the toenails of history. So what's going to happen next? Well, the prophecy gives us the answer in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. You'll notice it says, in the time of those kings. Which kings? The nations of today. The nations of modern Europe that have been attempting to unite. In the time of those nations, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom symbolized by the stone cut out without hands. The next great event on the stage of history 
is the coming of Jesus and the setting up of His kingdom. The Bible predicts that it will be Jesus who will set up His kingdom. The next world empire will be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the best news of all is this kingdom of peace and happiness that will last forever. Do you remember Franz Hasel, the German soldier who believed God's word with simple faith? He believed the predictions of Bible prophecy. He trusted in a God who was in control of the future no matter what. He accepted the promise of Jesus found in Luke chapter 12 and verse 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming to set up His kingdom. He wants you there. Are you ready? Why not make a decision to be a citizen in God's kingdom right now while we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for the great prophecies of the Bible that clearly tell us that Jesus is coming soon to establish Your eternal kingdom. We all want to be ready when Jesus comes. Please grant each of us a place in Your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. If you'd like to know more about Bible prophecy and what the future holds in store for you and your family, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's a booklet called A King, A Dream and You. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. This booklet will give you a fresh understanding of Bible prophecy and provide you with a new insight into your future, one that is filled with hope. Here's the information you need. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now.